Ladies and gentlemen, so we have reached a, the time in our program when we will allow for a few minutes of questions and answers for Mr. DeBrun. Um, Mr. DeBrun didn't make a disclaimer before he uh, made his presentation, and so I do want to uh, do that for him. He is here tonight as an invited speaker for tonight's celebration event and not as a representative of the IMF. And so the views that he has shared tonight are his own personal views. Thank you. So if, uh, thank you. If, uh, if there are any, if any of you have any questions that you would like to address to Mr. DeBrun, we have an expert in the house. And I don't, I think this would be a wonderful opportunity for you to address some questions to him um, as it relates to his function and our country and the, the things that we need to do uh, to get on track. So now is your opportunity. We do have some assistants that are in the audience that will happily bring a microphone to you. So I'm scanning, I'm scanning. If you raise your hand, we can see you. Are there any questions for Mr. DeBrun? I don't see very well because I have light in my eyes. We do have someone there, okay. Many thanks for giving me this opportunity to ask you a question. Uh, my name is Blanca Beuving and I'm from the um, uh, Financial Super uh, Supervisory Board. So we are an independent uh, oversight institution. Um, could you maybe uh, elaborate a little bit more on the effects of interest rates, exchange rates? We know that Aruba has a fixed e exchange rate. I think it's very vital to remain uh, having such a fixed an exchange rate. But we'll, we've also seen that from other countries, facing these um, large fiscal problems, that having a depreciation helps or low interest rate helps. Could you maybe um, elaborate on the possibilities for Aruba? If you want to remain having a fixed exchange rate, what are the other options to uh, help uh, support a fiscal um, uh, improvement? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, it works. No, thank you, excellent questions. Indeed, uh, I, I'm not going to comment on the action rate issue. I mean, uh, the choice of an action rate regime, uh, you know, obeys to many, many different considerations. Uh, and uh, the ability to run an independent monetary policy, of course, is severely constrained by the existence uh, of a peg. Uh, here in Aruba, the, if I'm not mistaken, the main instrument of the central bank is the reserve uh, requirement, uh, simply because there is this, this fixed action rate. So monetary policy is constrained, but there is still some uh, room for maneuver. Uh, now, uh, the level of interest rates, it's related to this, to this, uh, to this issue of, of the fixed peg, because typically what happens when you have a credible fixed peg to another currency is that you will mechanically import, at least if the peg is credible, you will mechanically import the, the, the sort of level of interest rates plus maybe a certain premium uh, from the, the, the country to which you peg, which in this case is the US, so interest rates should be very low. That being said, the extent to which uh, a policy rate, which in the US right now is effectively zero, as we know, even though the Fed is uh, you know, uh, thinking harder and harder about you know, raising this rate at a very moderate pace over the, over the future, I mean, interest rates are still super low. So the extent to which this policy rate actually translates into uh, interest rates that you and I, as citizens of the country, can feel uh, depends upon how uh, the, 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 the local uh, financial sector is actually working. And that I, I honestly don't know. This is, this is the boundary of my ignorance of the Aruban economy. How does the financial sector actually work and how do these policy rates transmit to, uh, to uh, people like you and I and, and businesses in particular? Uh, that being said, you are completely right that having very low interest rates 
is actually a boon for the governments if they can maintain their fiscal credibility. That is, if they don't have to pay a risk premium on markets when they borrow, that is exaggerated, which is, which is not the case here because of various arrangements with the, within the kingdom, all right? Basically, you still, you're still facing very low borrowing rates as a government, which means that I would say the footprint of a high public debt on your budget remains relatively low, even if your debt is very high. So for instance, let me take a country that is not Aruba, neither the Netherlands, let me take my country, Belgium. Even though public debt in Belgium today is still above 100% of the GDP, I mean, the amount that Belgium spends on, um, on the interest bill, on, the, on servicing the debt, is still just a tiny fraction of what it was when debt was also 100% of the GDP, but in the 1980s. And, and so, well, it is a good thing and a bad thing. It is a good thing because it still allows you to, it gives you the room uh, to do the good things I have just discussed, which is to rearrange the composition of your expenditure because you don't have this huge impact of, uh, of the interest bill. But at the same time, let's think about it. When you don't feel the heat of a high interest bill, maybe you have less incentives to adjust. And, uh, you know, it's, there is, there is a, I, I like to talk about, uh, you know, the, 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 the complacency premium, which is a sort of negative premium that you face when, you, when you're a government, you borrow essentially for free in the market, and you may quickly become exceedingly complacent uh, on, the, on your level of debt. Because what truly matters when you, you know, prepare your annual budget, which is still an annual exercise, uh, is, you know, the footprint of the debt on the budget. And if that footprint is very tiny, there might be, you know, an incentive to become complacent about the level of that debt. And regardless of the level of interest rates, having a high debt is always and everywhere a source of vulnerability. Uh, and we have to keep that in mind because bad shocks can happen, including on interest rates. And if you are Japan today, for instance, which is facing a gross public debt of 250% of the GDP, you can quickly imagine what a one percentage point increase in the interest rate would do to Japan and to Japan's budget. The math is very easy to do. It's a huge adjustment uh, that would have to, to take place very, very, very quickly. All right, so I hope I answered your, your question. Thank you, Mr. DeBurn. Thank you for that question as well. We have the expertise in-house, so now is your opportunity to ask any questions that you may have for Mr. Dubrun. Are there any other questions from the audience? I see someone on this side. I see a hand. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is uh, Leo Moduro, and uh, until a uh, short while ago, I have been the executive director of the Chamber of Commerce. Um, here in Aruba, we, as a small island, we don't make uh, a terrific soccer football team. You know, we w are one of the worst members of uh, FIFA. But there is something else related with football we are very good at, and that is kicking the can down the road. And this is what we have been seeing for several years already, while the uh, financial, the fiscal um, situation has become f uh, from, from bad to worse. Um, uh, we still don't see the policies that we need to uh, put a stop um, to the, 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 the negative development we have right now. Um, um, as we are saying for years already, at the chamber at least, um, Aruba is doing great in spite of governance. And I think that uh, expression is still uh, worth saying it because uh, we don't have so many economic problems. We do have simply the problem of a uh, gross overspending uh, at, at, the, at the government side and uh, we do not see an end to that. Most so because of the enormous um, wage bill that government is paying. The payroll is unsustainable. When we talk about sustainability, I think that we should start there, make that sustainable. Um, uh, and um, 
because of this overspending and borrowing all the money, um, uh, I would like to ask you this. Um, in your opinion, because that's one of the discussions we have also, government was stating over the past years that they had to spend in order, uh, in, in order to overcome the economic crisis. Mm -hmm. But in a, comp in, a, in, a, in a country like Aruba, with an open economy, where every dollar or every florine that is spent will go out of the window because we do not produce anything, we only produce services, we export services, tourism, um, that means that you are not boosting any industry or agriculture or whatsoever in your own country. And so the idea of government spending and boosting local production doesn't work for an island like this. I would like to have your comment on that. Okay, well, this, there, there are many, many dimensions in your, in, in your question. I mean, so let, let me... <laughs> Well, I, I, to I, say only, the least. I only heard a question at the end, Mr. So Debra. I think, I think <laughs> I'm going to focus on the, uh, on the last one. And, and, and the, the, the very last part of your question is basically, if, I, if you allow me to reformulate it, is that, uh, Debra, what the hell are you talking about? Because, f you know, you, you mentioned that, you know, the budget could actually stabilize the economy, but when the economy is as open and as a rubas, uh, a fiscal policy can't work. Um, uh, you're, you're, you're right uh, in, in, to, to some extent. You're right to some extent because indeed, when you are a very small economy, if the government is trying to spend more uh, or tax less in order to uh, boost internal economic activity, uh, a lot of the benefits of that stimulus, as we call it, is going to go outside. I mean, there, 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 is, no, there is no doubt about that. I mean, uh, uh, let me take the example of another, uh, of another uh, small economy like, like, like uh, mine. I mean, when uh, in 2008 uh, in Belgium they mentioned, oh, the IMF is advising us to do a fiscal stimulus, but we're not going to do it. And they're not going to do it for a simple reason, is that if Belgium does a fiscal stimulus, if Belgium decides, say, to uh, do what the US did a few years ago, a cash for clunkers, program, that is you would give money to people so that they, they scrap their old car and buy a new car. Well, Belgium produces some cars, yes, but, but very few. And, and who would benefit? The French and the Germans, uh, not Belgium, right? And, and that's basically the kind of, of, of illustration that you have in mind. Where I'm, I'm less, I'm less uh, in agreement with you is when you talk about uh, the fact that the, the, the fiscal policy would be completely ineffective. There would still be an impact of fiscal policy, and, and uh, it, it will happen through two main channels. The first is uh, the tax system. I mean, clearly, if, you, if your income is lower or if you lose your income because of, uh, because of the recession, you're going to pay less taxes. So this is what we call an automatic stabilizer. And who will benefit from that? The Aruban taxpayer. So basically, the, the, the income of the Aruban taxpayer will be more protected, so to speak, at least in an aggregate sense, will be protected by, uh, by these automatic stabilizers. You'll pay, you'll, pay, you'll pay less money to the government. Uh, so that's one dimension. And the, the second dimension is social security, is the fact that you will get much more transfers uh, if, uh, if bad, things, uh, bad things happen. You have safety nets. Uh, what I understand you don't have in Aruba, which, uh, which, which, is, uh, which is unfortunate, is an unemployment, uh, what, I mean, as an unemployment insurance. That is, if you lose your job, say, let's take the Danish example, if you, you, if you lose your job for the next six months after you're losing your job, the government is going to give you 80% of your last pay. Not bad, right? For just having lost your job. But it's an insurance. And the, only the government can provide that insurance. Why? Because there is no private insurance in the world that is going to uh, insure you against the risk of unemployment, because that risk is correlated across all of us. 
if my, my, if my risk of losing my job because of a recession increases, your risk increases too, and your risk increases too. And therefore, no, in, no private business will go into ensuring that kind of risk. The government has to do it. So why don't you have such a system in Aruba? My understanding is that because it's very, high, it's very difficult to hire and fire people, or at least to fire people. Once you have a job, you have it. So why have an unemployment insurance in the first place? But one way to think about reforming this whole system is basically by having more flows in the labor markets, which means uh, you know, making it easier for uh, employers to actually fire people because they don't need them or because these people don't perform, whatever the reason, it doesn't matter, and then have a safety net that tell, by the government that's just like in Denmark, for instance, provide a, a pure insurance that is a replacement income, and if you quickly find a job after within the six months, that's great. Okay, you will not have experienced a loss of income and therefore you will still keep your consumption standards and so on and so forth. And if after six months you haven't found a job, maybe there is something wrong about you and maybe you need some training. <laughs> so if you need some training, then the government is going to say, okay, fine, uh, now it's not 80% of your last pay, it's gonna be 50%. But if you wanna keep those 50%, you'd better get some training. And guess who is provided training? Me, the government. I can also do that. And I can subsidize perhaps you know, uh, internships in different companies so that you, the mason, will become uh, a great nurse. Because this is exactly uh, the kind of challenges that we have when we, we try to make the labor market work. In the US, you had a lot of construction workers. And after the crisis, they were not needed. What was needed were nurses. So mm -hmm. the challenge, if you think about it, is how to convert a mason into a nurse. It takes training. There is no way around it. And so that's the kind of um, uh, thinking we're, we're trying to push. Think structural fiscal, not just the short-term stimulus. To the bottom line uh, the answer to your question is that, yes, you're right. There is very little that, uh, that uh, the uh, Aruban budget can do for uh, Aruba, specifically in terms of, of stimulus, but changing the structure of the budget and putting this into the broader context of needed structural reforms is something that can definitely be done. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you for simulating that, Mr. Maduro. We appreciate that. Okay, so we do have time for at least one more question. And I um, see there's someone good evening. to my mm -hmm. right. Oh, mm -hmm. someone has the mic. I'm sorry, my name is Norman Capiri, and I have one question on the um, statistical digest published by the Central Bank of 2014. They indicated that the uh, debt to GDP in 2011 was 61%, and 2014 it's 81%. The trend looks like by the, um, by the year 2017, we will reach 20, uh, 90% debt to GDP. Uh, these are all macro, uh, macroeconomic indicators. What does this mean on the microeconomic level? And how does the business community um, have to prepare or what can they expect with uh, a debt to GDP? at 90% and rising. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. You, you put your finger on perhaps one of the toughest questions anybody any, or any economist interested in, in public finance uh, has to answer, which is what is the debt level at which things really can turn sour? And uh, the short answer is that we don't know. I'm sorry, we, we just don't know. You're telling, yeah, 90% is high. Uh, Japan is at 250, and and still people are buying, uh, you know, uh, Japanese bonds as if they were hotcakes, and 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 still Japan has 250 percent gross debt to GDP ratio, so I just don't know when it becomes dangerous, and the problem is that we tend to know after it has become too dangerous. <laughs> Uh, so it's not, it's not very satisfactory, of course, as an answer, but I think that uh, to, um, to, to be a little bit more concrete, I would be worried uh, of a growing debt ratio, starting from, as you mentioned, an already high level, uh, if there was not 
uh, a, a strategy in place to actually uh, put ultimately this debt ratio firmly on a downward path, as you can read in IMF reports all the time, firmly on a downward path. And what I've tried to say tonight is that, you know, if we are thinking about the debt ratio, it's good to think about the numerator, what's on top. It's also good to think about what's uh, on the denominator. And, 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 and I think that it is time to think about not just a blind austerity where you're going you're gonna to cut everything at the same time and, and, and pray for the best. Uh, you know, you, you, there, are, there is room for changing the structure of both the expenditure side, uh, but, uh, but certainly also uh, the tax side uh, in Aruba. It's the case in other economies, but, but in Aruba, it seems to me at least from the little knowledge uh, I have accumulated over the past few days and just reading uh, reports and so on and so forth, that there is room for uh, doing exactly or, or push, putting together exactly the kind of strategy I have, I have mentioned, which is to frame the fiscal adjustment into a broader growth strategy. This is tough. Politically, this is, this is awfully tough. I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to be a, 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 you know, a decision maker today in Aruba because those decisions are going to be really darn difficult. Uh, but if, if, if there is, you know, a sense of urgency that is, that is emerging, uh, again, this can be done. But one has to realize that uh, this is going to be uh, complicated in the sense of the, uh, of, the, of the sequencing. Let me give you one very simple example, and then I'll stop because I tend to talk too much all, all, all the time, uh, which is, you mentioned earlier, and in another question, uh, the size of the wage bill uh, for, the, for the government. Yes, it is, it is high. I mean, in the world in general, uh, you know, the wage bill, and this is remarkably consistent across all income groups of countries. You look at advanced economies, emerging markets, low-income countries, on average, they all tend to spend about a quarter of the, their total spending on the wage bill. In Aruba, it's one third. So it's higher. It's a fact. Okay? There may be good reasons for that, but you need to come up with those good reasons because it happens to be higher than in the rest of the world. So, fine. So you may conclude from that, well, we have to do a civil service reform. We have to fire 2,000 people and things will get better. Well, if you do that, you will run into big trouble if you don't think about making the labor market work better. Because if the labor market doesn't work well enough, the problem is that when you lose your job, you're, you're in deep doo-doo. <laughs> <laughs> if the labor market doesn't work, that's, that's really over and people will fight for their life. I mean, that's totally understandable. So now you think about the sequencing and say, well, maybe I should try to have a grand bargain, put everybody around the table and say, well, this is the name of the game and we have to come up with something. Or then you have to be smart in your sequencing and say, well, maybe we should try first with fixing the labor market. And then if we fix the labor market and make sure that when you are jobless, it takes less than six months to, to find a job. And by the way, you have an unemployment insurance during that time, so, so you're fine, you can survive it well, then it becomes easier, maybe, to reduce uh, uh, the workforce of, of the government. It becomes more acceptable because if you lose your job in the government, you know that there, is, there are fair chances now that you will find a job in the private sector. Maybe not at, the, at, at those, those nice conditions that you had in the government sector, but okay, it's a job and it pays. So, so the, the, this, this very simple example, I guess, illustrates very, quite well the, the, the complexity that decision makers uh, face today. It's a, it's a really complicated uh, you know, plan to put together because everything is related. And there are deep, uh, you know, deep impacts on the life of many people. Uh, you just look at numbers, it's very easy to come up with, with measures. I mean, we do that all the time when you know, governments pick up the phone, call Washington and say, nobody wants to lend us money, so we call you because you're our bank of last resort. And we say, yeah, but we lend the money of the international taxpayers, so we want to be repaid. And in order to be repaid, there are conditions. Mm -hmm. 
And we can easily <coughs> come up with that kind of plan. It's, if you look at just the arithmetic, it's dramatically easy. But then the consequences uh, are real. Uh, and you can see how popular uh, IMF people are in, in certain countries. Uh, it's, not, it's, it's not easy. Uh, so uh, you have to think about the sequencing very carefully and the process very carefully. Uh, but the bottom line to your question is that I just don't know when people are going to become very nervous about the debt level in Aruba. But I know they will take great comfort if, you know, uh, uh, putting a plan, a credible plan together is actually uh, done and if it is consistently implemented year after year after year. And there, even if you reach 120 or 125, the prospect that ultimately you will go down to 85 after maybe five years of this, uh, this, this, this uh, or 10 years of this comprehensive strategy, uh, I think it's, uh, I think it's, it's, it's what we can, we can hope for. But I wouldn't put, uh, I, would, I would refrain from, you know, just putting uh, an, an arbitrary limit, say, at 105, we're doomed, because that's not true. You're doomed if you don't do anything yeah. to ultimately go down. Uh, but there is no magic number, and I want to be very clear on that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We do have a question from a gentleman. Yes. Thank you. My name is Satish. I'm an entrepreneur, a trader. And uh, referring back to the first question of tonight, what, what value do we have for Aruba to have an Aruba floating, which is now pegged to the US dollar, which actually has no fiscal value to help in the monetary system or in the economy here? But from your study, from your views of Aruba and the fluorine pegged to the dollar, and the condition we are in now and where we are headed, do you see anything that can be done which might be better to move directly to a dollar economy, maybe? Thank you, well, Mr. Satish. Action rate issues. <laughs> it's always tough for someone from the fund to, to actually answer that, even though, as you said, I mean, uh, I am protected by my disclaimer, but... Um, <laughs> uh, or by my disclaimer look, on your behalf. And, no, no, I, did, I, I, I think I did a disclaimer. I mean, that, that was slide yes, number two. Yes, you did, yes, yeah, you did. Yeah, but but we, anyway, it, it, ne it never hurts to, to, to remind it, especially reiterate. if this is the second question about the action rate peg. Yes. Um, well, is there, is there an easy, an easy, no, there is no easy answer to uh, whether we should go for, for a fixed or, or a flexible action rate regime. What truly matters is whether the policy mix, the macroeconomic policy mix that you have in place is consistent with the commitment to PEG or just to, to be in a free float. I mean, uh, if you are in a free float, uh, you also put yourself in a situation where, uh, you know, the good thing, you might think, is that, well, the action rate fluctuations can play a stabilizing role. That is, if I'm hit by a bad shock, that's fine. My action rate will depreciate. And if my action rate uh, depreciates, I will look cheaper to, to others, and others will come to buy my wonderful tourism services. I mean, that's one thing. The problem with that, propos that proposition is there are two problems. The first is that, well, it's only true to the extent that, you know, you don't have uh, uh, too quick in wage indexation clauses because when you have a depreciation of the action rate in a small economy, inflation picks up quickly because you import everything. So <laughs> inflation will pick up very, very quickly. And if wages are indexed quickly on inflation, it will take less than three months or six months for the benefit of the depreciation to entirely vanish. So the second problem is that all action rate movements are not born equal. Some are stabilizing, others are destabilizing. What if suddenly someone, you're a trader, okay, so if one of your colleagues say, oh my God, I have in mind 105% public debt to GDP ratio as being the ultimate limit for Aruba. For no good reason, I can tell you that. It's just an arbitrary number, 105. Then we reach 105. Then the, your, your colleague will say, okay, 
fine, I'm going to sell those bonds. I don't want to lend money to Aruba anymore. Then what will happen? Well, in a well-functioning market, if the price of the Aruban government bonds collapse, it means that the rate of return increases, and it means that the rate at which the Aruban government will have to borrow will rise. And I'm abstracting here from any kind of guarantee coming from the kingdom, okay? So I'm, I'm in a pure market environment. And what would happen then is that the 105%, which might have been perfectly sustainable at very low interest rates, will become unsustainable just because your colleague dreamt about 105 as being the limit. And 105 will become the limit because this is how uh, self-fulfilling debt crisis actually works. I believe that 105 is the limit. You look at your colleague, say, huh, he must know something I don't. And everybody, you know, the herd instinct, everybody does that. And at the end, you have that markets were right. 105 was a limit. But it's entirely self-fulfilling. It's entirely circular, all right? And that's what can happen also if you have a, a, a flexible uh, action rate uh, system, which is that suddenly you can be victim to a collapse of, of, uh, of your currency and, and, and capital flowing freely in and out of the country, you can be subject to these things. So now, the positive of having a peg here, uh, are here and everywhere, there are two positives. And this is why small open economies like Aruba's, but like Belgium before, we were pegged to the Deutsche Mark, like the Netherlands was also pegged to the Deutsche Mark, right? Well, the benefit are two. First, you basically import the credibility. You know, the Federal Reserve is a pretty credible central bank. The ECB, the Bundesbank at the time in Europe, was a pretty credible central bank. And we were happy to import that credibility through the peg. So lower interest rates on average. And the second, uh, the, the, the second uh, benefit of a peg is that since, you know, and that's Aruba specific here, is that most of your, uh, uh, you know, uh, tourism receipts, I mean, the, the biggest customers are the United States, right? Okay, so it's a, big la it's a bit like a commodity exporter. It's a bit like the United Arab Emirates, for instance, or Qatar. They are exporting oil. Oil is priced in dollars. So, of course, they have an interest to have a peg to, to, uh, to the dollar because then, you know, they're, they're just uh, pegging the value of their currency mm -hmm. to the value of their main export to the currency denomination of their main export. So in that sense, the peg is stabilizing. Of course, you might say, well, if I faced a bad shock, I would still like to retain the opportunity to devalue. But then again, since practically everything is imported, it will immediately translate it into high inflation. Credibility will be put uh, in question. And if you have indexation clauses on wages, the benefit of such exchange rate stabilization will be very tiny. So there are pros and cons to, 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 uh, to, uh, to, both, uh, to both sides of the, of the argument. But uh, perhaps the only word of caution I would have is that uh, you know, a devaluation is not a magic bullet. It has to come with other measures to make sure that it works. So you know, just to finish on that one, uh, Belgium had enormous competitiveness problem at the beginning of the 1980s. It was pretty much looking exactly like Greece, same numbers, okay? And in 1982, what happened is that Belgium had one devaluation, 8.5%, and that was it, okay? Same numbers in Greece, same numbers in, in Italy at the time. Italy devalued like many times after, why? Because what happened in Belgium at the time is that after the 8.5 devaluation, they say, we're going to freeze wages for five years. So you had the shot in inflation, but wages were flat, nominal, for five years. So that, indeed, this gave really a boost to businesses because the real cost of hiring people actually fell dramatically. And so, uh, you know, a devaluation can be successful, but only with a lot of accompanying measures that make sure that it can actually work. Otherwise, you end up like Italy and Greece in the 1980s and 90s in the context of the European monetary system. You devalue every six months. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I received a signal from one of our assistants that we are able to take one last question. 
<laughs> Should I bring you some water, sir? No, that's okay. You're good? No, I'm fine. I'm... Do we have any more questions for Mr. DeBrun? Help me scan. Okay, we do have a question over on this side of the room. Sir, your name? Uh, Robin Harshendry. Is there an ideal size of government to the size in relation to the size of your economy? Well, thank you, Robin. This is a this is a short question that this time calls for a short answer, which is no. <laughs> Uh, it's really, it's really social preferences. I mean, uh, what I can tell you is that compared to, I mean, Aruba has all the features of an advanced economy. So compared to advanced economies, actually, the Aruban government, in terms, if you measure it in terms of spending to GDP, is reasonably small. It's, it's on the small size, the small side of the distribution. I mean, typically in advanced economies, total government spending represents about 45 to 50 percent of GDP. So uh, Aruba is is about thirty something. So 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 I mean it's 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 relatively relatively small, especially for uh, for a, a small open very small open economy, where the government tends to be the sort of employer of last resort, lender of last resort, uh, you know buyer of last resort, etc., which you see in a lot of neighboring economies, where actually the size of government is much larger and where public debt issues are also much larger and everything. So, uh, but short answer, no, there is no ideal size of government. This is, uh, this is really a choice of, uh, of countries. But, and that will be my last word, there is a very strong empirical correlation between the size of government and the degree of openness of a government, so the, the, of, a, of an economy. So the more open the economy, all else equal, as we say, uh, the bigger the government tends to be. Uh, and that's very simple. Again, that's because the government is the last resort very quickly in smaller economy. And so having a government at 30% something of GDP in an economy with the features like Aruba's is definitely not large by the standards of the world economies or the 188 members of the International Monetary Fund. That's all I can tell you. Okay. <laughs>